Hi, this is Dr. David Wright, and I just wanted to welcome you back to the Fresh Start with Dr. David podcast. So um, as I announced during the last podcast, I'm going to start doing episodes more frequently. Uh, I'm going to start covering more topics that are currently in the news. Uh, I'm going to be relating those to health, mental health, wellness, self-improvement, well-being, those types of things. And um, anyway, talking about challenges that are presented to us, uh, and specifically, or more specifically, solutions to some of the problems that seem to be growing in America. Problems related to health, wellness, diet, nutrition, weight, disease, um, gosh, uh, viruses, pandemics, uh, uh, inflation, even though it's not necessarily a business con, uh, 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 podcast, but I will be talking about the uh, the concept of inflation and just kind of like the government's approach to it and things like that. And um, that's really relevant in terms of, you know, people living and managing money and making smarter decisions with their money and just kind of working around that. Um, but I'm going to be talking about a lot more topics and I'll be um, also having special guests. So I'm really, really excited about this season. I did do a podcast yesterday. Uh, it's, it hasn't been, it's been a minute since I've done two podcasts uh, back to back, doing one one day and doing one another the next day. But, you know, like I said, you're going to be hearing more frequent podcasts from me and I'm going to be covering a lot more topics and, um, and hopefully providing you with more solutions, more information, things like that. And then, you know, tell you other things that are going on with me and my practices and things like that. So, Anyway, I just wanted to welcome you back to the Fresh Start with Dr. David podcast. Like I said, I recorded an episode yesterday. It was kind of an update episode. Uh, It was about upcoming topics and upcoming podcasts. I talked about some of the podcasts that are upcoming in that podcast. I'm going to do a podcast upcoming on COVID-19 and the pandemic and everything that has to do with the pandemic from the variants to the symptoms to risk factors to treatments to preventative things to proactive things and you know uh, even though the purpose of the podcast is not really to go into politics I'm also going to talk about kind of the evolution of this it's happened before this is not the first time we've had a pandemic like this people tend to have short-lived memories about things like this we had another one um, where some a scientist a Dutch scientist I believe was fooling around with some things in a lab and that's where we got avian flu from. Um, so there, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that are going on that we need to take notice of and we need to do something about if we can. Um, so I will be doing a big, pretty expansive episode on the COVID-19 pandemic. And actually, after I thought about it yesterday, I actually might turn that into two separate podcasts. Um, one that's specifically just talking about the virus itself and the health and, 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 wellness and sickness and illness ramifications of it and then the other one that's just talking about how it's affected us in our lives um, socially uh, economically and uh, you know otherwise so i'm probably going to break the covid19 pandemic episode into two separate episodes because i just think it's a lot to cover which is kind of why i've kind of put it off Um, i'm also going to talk about the new virus from china there's a new virus that's out Uh, from China. I think it was announced maybe three or four months ago. I'm going to do a full podcast episode about that. I'm going to talk about that and any related viruses that are out. I think that's really, really important. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about that in the COVID-19 pandemic um, podcast because I think it's relevant um, just from a social standpoint. If all these viruses are coming from the same place, what's going on? Uh, And we need to have some serious conversations about this and uh, and about the the effects that it's had on people, financially and otherwise. If somebody else caused this virus and they did it knowing they could cause this, then they need to pay for it. They need to, you know, we need to be reimbursed for this. Um, and I'm not going to get into a lot into it right now, but, you know, um, I'll have more statistics about it. But when I do the podcast, you're going to see that it's cost tr- trillions of dollars. It's cost the whole planet trillions of dollars. So to me... If some scientists, some researchers, some doctors, whatever, in China fooled around with stuff and created this virus, then why should the rest of the world have to pay for it? You know, that's just not fair. Uh, And, you know, (laughs) so anyway, uh, I will definitely talk about that concept. I'm also 
going to do a, uh, a podcast about boundaries, a podcast about time management, uh, podcasts about setting priorities and decision making, uh, a podcast about values, beliefs, and principles, a podcast about ADD and ADHD. We'll be talking about focus, concentration, attention, distractions. I think it's really, really relevant now because, you know, I think a third of the population believe that they have ADHD or ADD or symptoms of ADHD. Um, and a lot of them are unfortunately prescribed prescription stimulants that are addictive in nature and cause a bunch of other problems, including cardiovascular problems and also some mental health issues too. So I'll be doing a huge podcast about that because that's one of my specialties. I help a lot of people who want to work through their ADHD symptoms without medications, which like I said, are addictive, generally speaking. Um, so I'll be talking about that. I'm also gonna, I'm gonna do a huge podcast on anxiety and worry. And I'm gonna talk about kind of my approaches to that. That's another specialty for my practice is helping people with anxiety and worry without prescription medications. Um, usually it's treated with benzodiazepines uh, which carry a lot of risks like addiction and like falls and, you know, cognitive things, cognitive decline. So I'll talk about that. I'm also going to do a podcast about PTSD and adjustment disorders. Um, so I'll be talking about adjustment and trauma. I'll be talking, I'll do a podcast on loss, grief, and bereavement. That's a huge thing. And I have a special service that I offer through my practice to help my clients who are dealing with loss, grief, and bereavement. It's a process there are stages of grief that you have to work through. Usually, most people don't necessarily work through those in a linear fashion. They kind of bounce all over the place depending on a number of variables. And I have a specific process that I help to help people start working through the stages of grieving. Uh, and that's a, 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 um, a session that you can schedule through my office. Clients who've done it so far have been um, miraculously surprised at how well that it's helped them in terms of starting to work through the stages of grief. So that's something I'll be doing a podcast on. And then I'll be doing a podcast on relationship rules and relationship dynamics. So uh, that's really, really good. Everybody has a relationship with somebody. Most people have multiple relationships. And that, uh, that podcast will be about relationship rules, relationship dynamics. And it'll also relate back to another podcast that I'm going to be doing which is the podcast on boundaries. I think I mentioned that earlier, but it's hard to talk about relationships without talking about boundaries. If you've got relationships, you've got to have boundaries. And usually boundaries are used to help define relationships and prevent certain imbalances from occurring um, in relationships. So those are some of the podcasts that I'm going to be doing in the near future. So stay tuned. I'll, like I said, I'll be doing them more often. And I believe I'm going to be doing another podcast tomorrow and I'll have a special guest. And that one is going to be about stability. So I'm really, really excited about that. Um, and I think it'll be a, a good a good, and knowledgeable um, podcast. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with today's topic. Um, this topic is one that's been in the news a lot. And I was kind of, uh, I wasn't sure how I wanted to approach it. Um, so I, I thought about it for a couple of days. Um I also mentioned it in a previous podcast, but I'm going to go ahead and do this podcast. So this podcast today is about the Ohio train derailment, right? It's about what happened, what could have pre been prevented from happening, what was released into the air, into the water, what those things do, um, the response from the people who live there, the response from the CEO and the uh, EPA, etc., and just kind of some general things that I'm going to mention about the environment and the air and the water and things like that. So um, anyway, this is kind of new territory. Uh, I've never done a podcast on this kind of issue before, but I think it's definitely relevant. Um, and I'm going to try to not be a reporter about it. There's plenty, I guess, at least from what I was able to find out from the research that I did. There's plenty on this topic. I want to specifically talk about it from just kind of a social perspective, psychological perspective, uh, and then a health and wellness perspective. Um, and, you know, especially as, as this relates to health care and wellness and how we treat our bodies and those types of things. So welcome back. Uh, I'm excited to have you here. As I mentioned on the last podcast, the Fresh Start with Dr. David podcast is now everywhere. So you can find it anywhere that there are podcasts. Apple Podcasts, iTunes, 
um, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Spotify, um, Alexa, Amazon Music, and it will soon be on Google Podcasts too. So it's everywhere that podcasts are found. So definitely subscribe to this podcast, share it with other people, rate it. I also have started uh, a crowdfunding page for the podcast. And let me just tell you a little bit about that. The crowdfunding page is about raising money, um, not just for the podcast um, and what I'm trying to share uh, with listeners, but it's also about a new 501c3, a nonprofit that I started that's aimed at helping teens, adolescents, and young adults to gain the life skills and the resiliency skills that they need so that they don't become the next generation of people who need psychiatric care. So it's a proactive, preventative nonprofit that I've started. I'm really excited about it. Um, it's something that I started last year, and um, it's moving through the stages of, of becoming real. So uh, you can go to my Facebook page um, and check that out. Um, and uh, there's more information about that. I also have three Facebook groups, and they are free to join, absolutely 100% free. So the first two are, are private. They're called Fresh Start with Dr. David and uh, New Balance with Dr. David. Those are private groups. And then the last one is called GROW, capital G-R-O-W, all caps. And GROW is a public group. So I, in these groups, I usually share a lot of positive affirmations, daily motivational quotes. Some of those are found in my book. Others are found uh, elsewhere. Those are absolutely free. And if you join the GROW group on Facebook, then you can share them. The other two groups, you know, they're private. You can't share attachments. Uh, I did not know that when I created those and made them private. And you can't, once you create a group on Facebook that's private, you can't change it to public. You can do the opposite. You can change a public group to private, but you can't change a private group to public. And, and I guess it makes sense why. Because people join a group based off the notion that there was privacy, uh, and then you change it and make it public, then I guess you'd have to make everybody re-agree so they don't want to do that on Facebook. So anyway, I won't even go into that. <laughs> so, but anyway, welcome back. And um, anyway, um, like I said, um, I would encourage you to, to join it, especially the Grow Facebook group where you're going to get free positive affirmations that you can share with your circle, share with your friends, share with your relatives. It's free. It's uplifting. It helps you set the tone for each day. Um, and um, it's just something that's good for you. Um, in terms of uh, the crowdfunding page, I'll be giving you more information about that, but you can find that online in any of my groups and on my Facebook page. Um, so, and if you look me up on Facebook, you should be able to find me, um, Dr. David Wright. Uh, I think my Facebook uh, page is, you know, www.facebook.com backslash MLCOGA. I think that is, which is the initials for my, um, my first practice so anyway that's how you can find me but you can just look me up um, and you can you can find me in most places you can also just visit my practices and locate me there and send me an email or whatever or request an appointment or whatever and then I can send you to the, the Facebook page if that's what you're looking for and you can find the crowdfunding pages there too so anyway let's go ahead and get started so today I'm talking about the Ohio train derailment um, I mentioned a little bit about it in the prior um, in the prior episode that I recorded yesterday. And I just want to say this kind of off the bat. Um, I mentioned a little bit about what the residents had to say yesterday. The, um, the people who live there and are having to live through all of this uh, and suffer through all of it. And then also kind of the response from the CEO that just kind of seemed not to be in touch with what they were saying. It seemed robotic. It didn't seem, um, you know, very feeling... Um, I mean, I don't know what his background is. It sounds like he's been with the company for a long time. But, you know, I just kind of got the feeling that he's like a company man, just saying what the company has told him to say or what he feels like he needs to be saying. But it didn't sound like he was in touch with them. It didn't sound like they're being listened to. It doesn't really sound like the governor's really listening to them very well or hearing them. It doesn't sound like a, a lot is going on. And, and, you know, and that's just sad. I think a lot of it could be prevented. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about what I found online when I looked it up. I also will preface this with the fact that I watched the CNN town hall the other night uh, where I saw 
all these things, the residents who were talking about it, the people who were affected, the people who live there, work there, drink the water there, breathe the air there, and the CEO. And I think there was a little brief announcement from the head of the EPA and things like that. But I'll just, if you don't know a little bit about it, I'll, I'm going to share a little bit. So as a result of the derailment, the train derailment, 38 rail cars derailed and a fire ensued that damaged an additional 12 cars, right? Um, so, and there were 20 total hazardous material cars in the train, um, 11 of which derailed, right? Um, and I did a little bit of research, uh, and according to what I found, as it turns out, derailments are the most common type of train accident, and they are not uncommon. Um, federal U.S. data shows that there were 1,800 train derailments in 2021, which averages about three train derailments each and every day of the year. Well, that makes sense. There's 365 days in a year. Multiply that times three, you get about 1,000, 1,100. So that makes sense. In this case, the NTSB, the National uh, Transfer, Transportation uh, Safety Board, or Train Safety Board, but I think it's Transportation, National Transportation Safety Board came out and said this, the overheated wheel bearing led to the Ohio train derailment. A wheel bearing on the train's 23rd car overheated to a dangerous degree, um, a new T NTSB report says. An earlier warning may have helped to prevent the derailment, officials said. And then also read and saw um, some articles online or the report online from the NTSB, which showed that actually uh, that there were like a series of three or four warnings about that same bearing overheating. And it wasn't until the third one reached that it reached a certain point that they actually did something about it, that they started slowing down the train. So it wasn't a single warning that they got. It was like three or four, a series of ones. And it's not until then that they started slowing the train down. I also found out that, um, you know, um, there were some other things, but, Apparently, this accident was 100% preventable, according to the NTSB, right? Um, so how many trail der train derailments are, happened last year? So there were about 1,000 last year, um, about 1,049 specifically, uh, and that's out of 535 million miles traveled. So yeah, that's not a lot of accidents if you consider how many miles uh, and it says here that the most common cause of train derailments is trains going too fast, right? Excessive speeds. And then the second cause was misaligned or broken rails, right? Uh, and in this case, it sounds like there was a bearing that got too hot. And specifically, that train derailment um, um, involved the release uh, of five toxic or mainly five to toxic chemicals into the air, soil, or water surrounding the crash site. Vinyl chloride butyl acrylate, ethylene glycol, isobutylene, and ethyl hexyl acrylate. So <laughs> none of those sound very friendly. Um, and I think most people have heard of those chemicals, especially vinyl chloride. Maybe you haven't heard of butyl uh, acrylate, but I know I've heard of seeing these chemicals. So I've heard of vinyl chloride. We used to, we have to study that in medical school and we had to actually learn what diseases were associated with the most common toxins, right? And that was one of them that we had to learn. Uh, so I can't remember specifically. Maybe it was lymphoma uh, or Hodgkin's lymphoma or something like that. But it was some kind of uh, some kind of you know lymphoid disease. I remember being associated with that. But I'm certainly it's I'm certain that it's not just uh, just um, limited to that. Most of these chemicals cause all kinds of problems with all kinds of organs, from the liver to the lungs to uh, the kidneys, the brain, um, and certainly um, the lymphoid tissues, right, the immune system. Um, so vinyl chloride, butyl acrylate, uh, ethylene glycol, which I've definitely heard of, isobutylene, which I've definitely heard of, and then exyl, ethyl hexyl acrylate. So vinyl chloride... Uh, ethylene glycol and isobutylene were the ones that I'd heard of before, right? So those are just some of the, the basics surrounding, surrounding this, and I'm just going to go through it, and then finally I'm going to talk, get to the chemicals and the risk factors and those kind of things. Um, but like I said, um, in this specific accident, um, 
based on the National Transportation and Safety Board, it wasn't just one warning. It was like three or four warnings. So, uh, you know, I guess the obvious thing is, you know, why didn't they start slowing down or stopping the train after the first warning? Why did it take the third one? Um, I don't know. I mean, that's the, I guess that's the first kind of question that pops in my head is, why do you have a warning at the lower level if you're not going to do anything about it, if you're just going to ignore it? And then you've got another warning at a higher level. So apparently this bearing was reaching different temperatures, according to what I read. What I read. And then one, one, one warning was based off one temperature. The next warning was a slightly higher temperature. And the next warning was another higher temperature. So what's the point in having the first warning if you're not going to act on it? I guess that's the most obvious thing to me. It's, there's no point in having the earlier warnings if you're just going to ignore them. The other thing that I mentioned uh, in the previous podcast, too, is that this company that, that ran this train, Norfolk Southern Railroad, they have been fighting regulations for years regarding the safety of these trains and the number of people that should be on them and, I guess, the sensors and the technology and everything. So all of these regulations that... I think should be in place to protect communities as a proactive measure because communities matter, uh, which goes back to something else I'm going to do a podcast on, which is about values. And so, you know, I guess the, the immediate obvious thing to me is if these safety measures are meant to protect the people who live in the communities where these trains are flowing through um, and you fight them or you don't want them, then you don't really value those people. That's, is that not obvious? Um, you don't value them. You don't value their lives, their livelihood, their ability to have a safe environment, their ability to have a, a, a wilderness and outside and, and, and land and water and trails and things that they can enjoy and, and feel safe in where their kids can, you know, th that's the obvious thing to me is this company doesn't value at least enough these people's lives or their livelihoods. They just don't care. I could word it a different way that the, the thing that just popped in my head, they just don't give up whatever bleep. But that's what it says to me. Uh, they just don't care. What they do care about is the things that they are involved in, like buying back stock and, and stockholder equity and, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that's just sad. Uh, and But, you know, here's the thing. Uh, and I mentioned this in the podcast from yesterday. That's where we are in this country right now, where a lot of, for a lot of companies and a lot of people too, the only thing they value is money, 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 money. And that's true in our healthcare system too. It's sad because the biggest players in healthcare, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, and large healthcare organizations, that is all they care about is money, money, profit, revenues. That's it. And I think when you start there, if that's the goal in everything that you do and how you respond to things, you know, it didn't, it shouldn't be a surprise, the results that you get. So this accident was absolutely preventable because there were three warnings and this company has been fighting regulations for years that are meant to protect this community. Uh, and it's the job of the EPA to environmental protection agency it's their job to protect communities right we could say environment but we're really talking about people's lives their livelihood uh, and you know what are these people supposed to do now to me it doesn't matter if it's five thousand people or if it's five million people i mean obviously it's a greater effect at, at five million people if five million people lived where in this area where it happened but even if it's five thousand people those five thousand people's lives matter um so you know, I, I guess that is the biggest thing that bothers me is, uh, you know, the reason the reason why we have EPAs and things like that is because companies don't very do a very good job of regulating themselves. Whether you're talking about police departments or you're talking about physicians or you're talking about attorneys or judges or anybody else, they we just don't do a good job of regulating our own behavior. And that's why we have laws and rules and agencies and organizations now obviously the opposite side of that is is over regulation of things um but and maybe there are some some sectors some areas uh, in the united states that are over regulated i can think of a couple 
just the top off my hand, top of my head, uh, that are overregulated compared to other areas. But this one doesn't seem to be. And like I mentioned in yesterday's podcast, if you look at the difference between the rails, the the, the train systems that I see in Asia, like these high speed, you know, technologically advanced systems, and here we are, the most powerful nation on earth. And we've got these rinky-dink, old, run-down, rusted, uh, you know, out-of-commission infrastructure things um, that do a disservice to us all and put communities at jeopardy. Um, and as an aside, and I thought about this after I recorded the, the podcast uh, yesterday, but as an aside... You know, the other thing is, is look at all these near plane crashes and plane crashes. Actually, a couple weren't just near plane crashes. They actually happened. Um, and I mean, you know, and I guess that brings in the, the, you know, the FAA and the air traffic controllers and the technology on the planes and, and all that kind of stuff. But like, why can we not get our act together? Why do we not care about enough about safety and preserving human life i guess that's my bottom line um because you know obviously you know i'm an md um you know md's take an oath to do no harm and to do good the first thing that i look at is is you know health wellness uh well-being things like that and the importance of it and if something's important then you do things to protect it if you don't do enough to protect it that kind of says you don't value it enough so why is it in 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 a country that you know that we love why can we not control what people do to protect and preserve the sanctity of human life right where are our values where are our beliefs where are our principles I, i think they're misaligned i think they're really really misaligned but anyway let me get back a little bit to um the chemicals. So, according to what I'm reading right here from NPR, more than a hundred thousand gallons of vinyl chloride were burned. A hundred thousand gallons, right? Uh, specifically, it says here to prevent that, uh, prevent um, an uncontrolled explosion. Uh, the responders evacuated residents of the immediate area and performed a release and burn of five tank cars worth of the chemical which amounted to 115,580 gallons of vinyl chloride. Um, And, you know, that's used for for plastic, for cars, and all kinds of stuff. Um, But anyway, um, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources reported that 3,500 fish had died following the derailment in nearby waterways. And I guess this this is my big thing where they were you know, basically trying to say that these residents should, are okay to drink the water and everything's okay and the symptoms that they're reporting aren't happening and all that kind of stuff is this, you know, number one, I don't think these people are are faking it at at all. I think they're really sick. I think their symptoms are valid. And I think it's, it's, it's only in, in a world that we live in where somebody would try to suggest that, that it's, that they're not really really sick um you know especially with children with nosebleeds and stuff like that you know that's one big thing but the other big thing is is this like last time i checked fish weren't going to get a settlement check (laughs) you know uh you know fish swimming in streams and ponds and reservoirs and stuff like that they don't have a reason to fake it So if fish are dead, and I don't care if it's from something that happened on the day that it happened, right? And that's, you know, according to what I read, some people were trying to suggest that that's just stuff on the surface. Who cares if it's just on the surface or not? You know, last time I checked, stuff didn't necessarily always just sit at the surface, right? Uh, So, you know, even if somebody, even if this company or somebody else tried to say that the, um, you know, that people were exaggerating or faking it, trying to get a settlement or something like that. Um, I don't think the fish are faking it. I just, you know, or the wildlife. I haven't even looked about other wildlife, but you know, what I read was about the fish. So they're not faking it. You know, something, something made that happen. And after there's a bunch of dead, and that even brings up another thing, uh, issue 
if they're dead fish floating in the water, is that good drinking water? I mean, you know, I don't know. I don't know that our water purification systems are meant or designed uh, for drinking when there's a bunch of dead animals in the water. Now, obviously, there's always dead animals in, in every body of water. There's something that's died there. But if the number of dead animals or fish in a body of water that's used at some point to make drinking water or used for something else, at some point there's too many dead things in the water for it to be easily cleaned. I, that, to me, that's obvious. So, and not only that, but, you know, if kids are seeing this, why would you force them to drink the water? I mean, it's, it, then it becomes not just a, a physical thing uh, or, or a medical thing or a health thing. It becomes a psychological thing. I mean, I mean, you know, like who wants to drink some water that you know came from a place where there are all these dead fish floating around after a chemical explosion and a derailment of a train and release of chemicals? I mean, that's just from a psychological standpoint, that doesn't seem right, right? So, you know, there's the health and wellness of the body, but then there's also the psychology of it, you know, and that just doesn't seem like a good thing to do, um, you know, if there's 3,500 fish dead in nearby creeks. Right, uh, and who knows if there's even more. Uh, but let's uh, let's talk about a little bit more uh, about the chemicals. Before I do that, though, I do want to mention this, um, and this is just something I, I haven't researched this myself, uh, but I do think that I saw this on the news. But one of the things I noticed is that the director of the EPA kind of went after the CEO, and, and basically he said, "I'm not. I don't have a question. I have an order." And that's to, you know, do what's right and things like that, which I totally get it uh, that he needs to do. The CEO of the company and the, the company's board of directors or whoever's in charge there needs to do right by these people, whatever that means. If that means buying their houses or, or taking care of all their medical bills or having them moving them or whatever, they need to do what's right because they were in the wrong and this is, was preventable. So they should have full liability, period. And I mean, I think that's what they have insurance for. I don't know the limits, obviously, of their policies, but that's what insurance is for. Um, so, you know, that's one thing. But, you know, and wh whether or not you agree with the, the tone of the EPA director and how he said that, you know, is one thing. But here's something that something mentioned, somebody mentioned to me. Some people told me that the, the people from the federal EPA actually did not go there. So... There's a lot of questions. I don't know if you've been keeping up with the with the latest issues about this now. Is but a lot of people are criticizing the the water results and the other results that they're doing that they're saying that this is safe and they're like saying, well, no, there's some flaws in this. The water's really not safe. If you look at this, if you look at that, they're testing for stuff that's not even a part of what what was uh, a contaminant or that that derailed things like that. And it made a lot of sense to me. Uh, you know, a test is going to be negative if you're testing for something that's not supposed to be there. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's common sense. So, uh, but somebody, uh, you know, I've heard several people say, and I think it was on the news, um, uh, that federal people, um, from the EPA haven't even gone there to investigate. And if that's the case, that kind of makes me wonder why. And the other thing about it too is, is, is this, and this is just kind of a medical principle. Um, and I'll t explain to you why I'm even bringing it up. If you... Testing is all about a couple of different things, uh, and I could do a full episode on testing. Um, but testing, uh, the, the so one, two of the two or three of the important things about testing is number one, what you're testing for, right? Number two, the accuracy of the test, right? So tests have sensitivity and specificity. Uh, they have accuracy and precision. So you have to look at all those factors for a test. How sensitive is the test? What will it pick up? Well, what not? What is it not able able to pick up? Uh, you know, how sensitive it is, how specific it is, um, you know. And then you have to look at the the last thing that's really really important is the technique of the person doing the testing, and that's whether you're testing somebody's nose or nostrils for uh, or internal nasal aperture or whatever you know anatomical area of the nose you're testing. If you're testing that for COVID. Or if you're testing, you know, the water or the soil for something, if you don't do the right test, if you don't test for the right things, if the test isn't accurate enough 
or precise enough, or if it's not specific enough or sensitive enough, sensitive enough, and the technique isn't right, you can't trust the results. So I don't blame these people from trusting the results. I wouldn't trust them either. Um, so, but I just wanted to say that. Um, and what you know, the thing that makes me really think about that is, you know, a lot of times in psychiatry, especially now, uh, in psychiatry and mental health, they'll drug test people. Uh, and they'll drug test and they'll go, oh, okay, yeah, um, you know, Mr. Smith is on these medications and, um, you know, his drug testing came back negative. But what a lot of times they don't do is to test to see that Mr. Smith is actually taking his, uh, you know, aripiprazole or if he's taking his Lexapro or if he's taking his Prozac or Wellbutrin or whatever it is. So a lot of times when people say that they're taking something, they aren't, but nobody really ever tests for it even in situations where they should be testing for it. It just doesn't happen. So there's a huge problem with testing. And even with COVID testing, I'll talk a little bit of, hopefully I'll remember to talk about this in the, in the COVID-19 podcast episode that I do. But even with COVID-19, there was a report that came out that showed that one testing company, 96% of the tests that they did were, that were really positive COVID tests, the company's test showed it was negative which meant the test was completely worthless. And this company's, I can't think of it. I, I could look it up, but obviously they're under investigation now because they charge a lot of money for those tests or they got reimbursed for those tests, you know? But a test is worthless. If, if you've got 100 people who take a test and all their results come back as the test was negative, like they don't have the disease or they don't have the virus or whatever, and then you do later investigations and research and find out that 96% of those people should have had a positive test, there's something wrong because those people went about their lives and spread whatever they had, COVID, whatever else, to somebody else with the false belief that they were negative when they were positive. And that's a huge problem with COVID-19 testing. I hear people say that all the time. Oh, I tested negative. Great, but it doesn't mean a lot. It only That's if the person who performed the test did it right. Um, half the time people don't even do the test right. The, 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 the technique of the person, the tester is, is bad or the test is just faulty. And a lot, I, I know my mom was, my mom was concerned about me because, you know, she see, she knows I see clients every day. I do consulting work and forensic psychiatry, um, and addiction psychiatry and forensics. Um, so, you know, I assist in forensic cases. Uh, I've been doing that for 15 years now for a long time and you know and I see a lot of things and you know my mom I guess she saw one of the TV ads or, or something she ordered some tests maybe she ordered them from Amazon I don't know but I got these tests it was called like eye test or something like that or uh, eye test or e-test or something like that it, it was some <laughs> silly name and you know the funny thing about it is uh, they sent me test B, but the instructions they sent me were for test A. So they sent me a mismatch between the testing instructions and the test. And I noticed that when I was trying to, you know, do the test. I'm like, uh, that doesn't add up. That So a lot of these companies, they don't give a darn about whether your test is accurate or not or what happens after that. They're just out to make money. And this company, I can't remember the name of the, the company. Um, it's, I got it at home. I saved some of those tests. But they don't care. They just don't care. It's all about the money. And that's where, that's, that's where you know, the issue of our values comes up. Uh, and, and if the value for everything associated with health and healthcare and wellness and environmental things is all about money, then you're always going to have bad results. So anyway, um, the, the test that I had uh, that, that my mom had sent, did not seem like accurate tests at all. Um, and I was just like, this is, this is crazy. I think it was made in China or somewhere. Um, which is a whole other thing. Um, that's another, uh, kind of anecdote that I noticed, uh, during this whole COVID pandemic is like, if you look at where the, the masks come from, the gloves come from, uh, all this kind of stuff, it all comes from the same place where supposedly where the virus came from. And it's just like, uh, okay, what are we doing here? Uh, like, does that make sense? Can we not, you know, power up America and put more people to work? But anyway, that's a whole different issue. And I'll talk about that in a later podcast. But let me just kind of get back to this. And then 
and, and then just kind of give some of my, what I think are some solutions and some of my opinions. So vinyl chloride, that's the number one thing that I mentioned. Vinyl chloride is a colorless gas that is used in the production of polyvinyl chloride, a widely used plastic material. Uh, it is also used in the production of other polymers and in the manufacture of other chemicals. Uh, and it can cause liver damage, uh, liver cancer, uh, it can cause Renaud syndrome, which is char characterized by numbness and tingling in your fingers and toes. Uh, and prolonged exposure can damage your nervous system, leading to dizziness, confusion, and even unconsciousness. Right? It's an environmental pollutant. Uh, and it causes a lot of other things too, right? Besides just that. And as you may or may not know, your liver is the organ that basically, whose job it is to detoxify and metabolize most of the things in your body, right? There's some other organs that help detoxify things, um, like your kidneys, but generally it's, it's the job of the liver. And this causes damage to your liver, and it also causes liver cancer, among other things. Ethylene glycol monobutyl ether, EGBE, also known as uh, butyl cellulosol. It's a chemical solvent that is used in a variety of industrial applications, including paint and varnish removers, degreasers, and printing inks. It can also be found in some household cleaning products, and I think that's where I've seen it before. Inhaling EGBE, EGBE vapors can cause respiratory irritation, coughing, wheezing. It can also damage the skin. It can cause skin irritation, uh, dermatitis. It can be, it's been linked to, uh, in long-term exposure, uh, it's been linked to liver and kidney damage, uh, blood disorders, um, and it's also uh, um, been linked to some other problems. Uh, butyl acrylate is a chemical compound that belongs to a group of chemicals called acrylic esters. Uh, and I remember we had to study this in, in chemistry. Uh, there were ethers and there were esters. And, and it's, I can't remember how many carbons have to be tied in a chain or whatever, but... Anyway, we have to study that. But it's a colorless liquid that is used in the production of various products such as adhesives, coatings, and textiles. Inhaling it can cause skin and eye irritation and can lead to respiratory problems. Prolonged exposure to high levels of butyl acrylate can cause more serious health effects such as headaches, dizziness, and nausea. It can also cause sensitization, which can lead to allergic reactions in some individuals. Um, ethyl hexyl acrylate is a clear colorless liquid, liquid that is used in the production of various products, including adhesives, coatings, and textiles. It can cause a similar kind of uh, symptoms. And then isobutylene, also known as 2-methylpropene, is a colorless flammable gas that belongs to a group of chemicals called olefins or alkenes. That's another group we had to study in chemistry, uh, alkenes. And it's used in, you know, rubber, uh, and there's a bunch in lubricants and things like that. Uh, and also as a fuel additive in gasoline. It's also a refrigerant and a propellant. And it can cause irritation of the eyes and skin. And it can also cause headaches, dizziness, and drowsiness. Um, the one thing I'm going to say about these chemicals, if you want to look those up, you can. Um, there's obviously a lot more things about these chemicals that I didn't go through, but I'm just gonna say a couple different things. Number one uh, is this. If you have headaches, a headache is a warning system, right? A headache is a warning system from your brain that something's wrong, and it doesn't matter the reason why you're having the headache. It doesn't mean, it doesn't matter if the headache is because your blood pressure, or if the headache is because you've inhaled something, or if the headache is because of a viral infection or whatever, a headache is a warning sign, right? It's a warning sign that your brain is under distress, right? It's a warning sign. And a lot of times when people have a stroke, it's preceded by a headache. Now, that doesn't mean that every time you have a headache, you're about to have a stroke. That's not what that means. And that's not what I'm implying. What I'm trying to say is a headache is a symptom that people really, really overlook easily. Oh, it's just a headache. Uh, and if it's a short headache and they're not chronic, not daily, uh, then it may not be a big deal. It may be because of allergies and your sinuses, right? Your sinuses might be inflamed. That could lead to a headache. Or it could mean the blood vessels in your brain are inflamed or some part of the brain is inflamed, right? Uh, so a, a headache could be benign, but there are certain things that you look for in, in, in medicine and healthcare related to headaches. 
when somebody says the worst headache of my life, that's a warning sign. If a headache lasts for a long time, right, hours, that's a warning sign. If a headache won't go away with over-the-counter insets, uh, like a leave or ibuprofen or Excedrin or things like that, then that's a warning sign. Um, if a headache is is so severe that you have to lie down, you can't hear sounds or smells or things like that, that's a warning sign. If your headache is followed by vomiting, things like that, those are warning signs. But the larger point is this. If you have a headache, regardless of the reason, pay attention to it, especially if it's chronic. If you start having chronic headaches, you need to go see a doctor. You need to see your family practitioner. You need to see a neurologist. You need to see somebody and get that fixed because headaches are warning signs. And if you ignore warning signs from your body, whether it's your skin, your integument, integument which is your skin, or if you're, it's your your breathing or your, your brain, which you know, the warning sign there is headaches with some other things, lightheadedness, dizziness, things like that. That's really, really important. So don't just let that go. Uh, address it. Um, so, and then the other thing I'm going to mention is this. Those five chemicals that were mentioned, that's when they're, those are the signs that you get when they're just by themselves. When you mix them together or when they all explode together, you get a whole bunch of other chemicals, right? The same thing is true with smoking. Uh, if you take a commercial cigarette, a commercial cigarette has, what, like 4,000, I think 4,500 chemicals in it, right? But when you burn it, you get a lot more chemicals than just the 4,000 chemicals because when those chemicals mix together or when they're burned, it produces different chemicals. When you burn something, it produces a different chemical or a different set of chemicals or species of chemicals from what was there before it started burning. So... And who knows if they can even test for all that. So that's why the testing doesn't necessarily matter in this case. And I don't think these people should be satisfied that a test came back negative. It doesn't mean anything. Um, like I said with the, with the company that 96% of their COVID tests came back negative when they were really positive. Uh, who knows how many lives were lost because of that? Who, who could measure that? We'll never know. Or how many tests that company gave out to people, leading them to believe that they didn't have COVID when they actually did. You know, so testing is not a foolproof thing, and these people should believe um, should believe the symptoms, and they should believe that, that or have disbelief I should, or doubt regarding the test. Because who knows if they're even testing for the right thing. When you start combining chemicals and then burning them off in a controlled release explosion, you don't start. You don't end up with the same chemicals that you started with. You end up with different chemicals, and who knows if they if they're even testing for those, right? Um, the way that I'm going to end this podcast is just just kind of a general thing that I'm going to talk about the environment, right? Um, and this is you know this train derailment is a symbol of a bigger problem, right? Just like the whole Michigan water crisis, and I'm just going to say this statement. This is just my belief. Is if you believe that tainted water is just um, specifically contained in Michigan, then I've got some swamp land I'd love to sell you in Florida. Water is tainted everywhere, and that's why that's why people drink bottled water now. That's why, and who knows what's in the bottled water? That's a whole different discussion. I would recommend that you check out the first chapter of my book, The Nutrient Diet. It's all about water and water consumption. Um, so, uh, and the reason why that book starts with water is because water is the most important thing that you put in your body and water is about 60 something, 63, 64% of your body. So we're mostly water. We're walking around with water that's in little cells and tissues, but we're mostly water. Um, uh, and that's why, you know, when we're in a car accident and things like that, we're so fragile and so many things happen. Football, uh, injuries, you can name it, but that's why, because we're mostly water. We're just walking water, honestly, um, encapsulated in cells and tissues and muscle and bones and things like that. But we're water. And that's why it's so important that the water is safe because water is in every part of your body. And most of the tissues, a lot of the tissues in your body are delicate. The tissues in the brain are delicate. Your kidney, your renal tissues, they're delicate. Um, the liver is a little bit more robust than some of the other organs, but... And so is the heart to some extent, but they both can be uh, damaged by chemicals and things like that. So 
if 60 something percent of your body is water, then yeah, you should be really, really concerned about what kind of water you put in your body. And I wouldn't be drinking the water there if I were those residents either. Um, but you know, like I said, it, it's part of a, a bigger, a bigger thing. Uh, and that's, you know, our water treatment systems, the water that's in different places is not safe to drink. I don't think it is. I, I think most people, some people might actually remember a few years ago, uh, I think it was since the pandemic started in 2020, that some some company or some, uh, not company, some group or some terrorist group or somebody uh, used, hacked into a, a, a a water treatment facility or a town's water treatment system, their computer system or whatever, and changed the proportions of, you know, fluoride or something that was in the water and made it toxic. I mean, that's how delicate our infrastructure is. And that's the biggest point that I wanted to make today is, you know, regulations and our infrastructure, our roads, our water, our railways, our train systems, our flight systems, all the different systems that we use and take for granted, those systems affect people. And in the case of this train accident, that affect a whole community. Um, and it's about proactivity and what we value. We should be valuing human life more. We should be valuing communities more. We should be valuing our water more and our food more and our water supply and our water systems and our electrical grid and all this stuff our roads uh, because the worse the roads are the more accidents they're going to be so we need to take a step back and value more the things that we take for granted and i really really stand with the people of of east palestine i think that's i was surprised when it was i heard it pronounced that way they pronounced it east palestine not Palestine. I was surprised, but I think actually Palestine is, is, I think it could go either way. Tomato, tomato, Palestine, Palestine. But anyway, they pronounced it Palestine, so I'm going to pronounce it the same way. But I totally stand with those people. I stand with the people of East Palestine. This is awful. This should not have happened to them. This company, uh, Norfolk Southern, should have valued their lives, their livelihood, their health, their wellness, their well-being the sanctity of their lives more, right? And they didn't, and they were negligent, and look what happened. Look what happened. So anyway, um, whether it's the water system, or whether it's trains, or whether it's planes, planes, trains, automobiles, uh, or your health and wellness, proactive, being proactive, being preventative is the most important thing. And like I said, what you do and what you fail to do, generally speaking, is a reflection of your values. And because companies value money more than anything else, the only thing we have left is the safeguards and protocols that we put in place. Uh, and so hopefully the EPA and all these other agencies do what they're supposed to do. Hopefully these tests get it right. I don't have a lot of faith in that, but I hope that they do. Uh, and hopefully the, the people of East Palestine and the surrounding communities are able to regain some sense of uh, safety and environmental security and things like that. And I'll end with this. The other thing too is the mental health aspects of this. I mean, you know, there are the even if adults handle this really, really well, which you know it's tough, but these kids are going to need some assistance. They're going to need some help. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to hear that. Some of these kids end up with issues and, 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 you know, phobias and anxieties and stuff associated with drinking water and things like that. It would not surprise me. Um, and for a good reason, because you know, people are telling them to, dr to drink water that's coming from places with, you know, 4,000 dead fish and where there are chemicals that have been spilled. So anyway, hopefully the government does what it needs to do. Hopefully this company is forced to do what they should have done in the first place. And I totally pray for the people of this community, and I hope that, that uh, other people, like myself uh, and like you, are willing to do whatever you can to help these people return to normal. And with that, I'm going to wrap up this podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I look forward to um, uh, doing another podcast tomorrow on stability, uh, which I'm excited about. 
Uh, I want to share some of the things that I think are really, really important in creating a life that's characterized by stability and to have stable relationships. So anyway, tune in tomorrow. Uh, again, uh, thanks so much for joining me for this podcast episode on the Ohio train derailment that occurred uh, around or in East Palestine, Ohio. And do what you can, if you can, to help those people out, whatever that means or whatever you're able to do. Um, so anyway, I will see you at the next podcast. Thanks so much for joining me again for the Fresh Start with Dr. David podcast. Bye-bye.